So today we are going to start with uh, the basics of optical characterization and in this uh, since we are talking about optical characterization I must tell you at the outset that uh, this is actually a quite a huge topic. We need to know a lot of concepts here, uh, a bit of formula, uh, some, some concepts which we already have learnt beforehand. We are going to look into all of them together. What happens is if you are considering any kind of material, let it be a nano material or a bulk material or some liquid sample and you want to do some kind of characterization which is based on the incidence of electromagnetic radiation on the sample and reading the signals uh, of that electromagnetic sin, uh, signal after it interacts with the sample, uh, most of them actually comes under this uh, optical characterization technique. Uh, if you consider something like the UV visible spectroscopy or the IR spectroscopy or the Raman studies, all these are a part of optical characterization. So uh, to begin with, uh, I'll just want to suggest you one book uh, which you can actually check uh, that's uh, Practical Material Characterization. Uh, till now we have uh, studied about XRD and all uh, and uh, there also more information is there on this particular chapter on this book. Mm, uh, the content for these uh, few lectures I have taken, uh, some part of the content for these few lectures I have taken from this particular chapter which is introduction to optical characterization of material. Uh, since we are uh, bound by time, so we are not going to uh, expand uh, our studies to the other techniques which are listed in this book. But if you want to refer to this book, you can uh, definitely get, uh, get a copy. Uh, this is a very helpful book for understanding the optical properties. So when we talk about optical properties and we look around, we actually find out the example more or less everywhere, okay, which is basically nothing but an optical behavior. So if we consider how hot an incandescent object is, we can actually know by the color of the light it emits. For example, if you have got something which is red hot, you know that the color red actually signifies that the temperature is very, very high. If we want to look into the variation of the thickness of a soap film, uh, it can be actually estimated by knowing the different colors of the light that it transmits. So if it's a very thick uh, layer, probably it won't show you all the colors, but if it's a very thin layer, the chances are that you would be able to see a rainbow combination of colors. And then the relative concentration of some solutions by the amount of light it absorbs. So if it is a very concentrated pitch dark sample, uh, might be the amount of light that is absorbed is the entirety is is the entire part of the uh, uh, visible light, right? But in the other hand, if it is a semi-transparent or let's say translucent sample, some part of the light will be absorbed, but some will be actually uh, transmitted. So that can be studied. So we can know how concentrated the solution is. Usually, we look into it from a visual point of view and we know the concentration, but that's actually a part of optical characterization. So these are something which is nothing but more or less based on observation. But optical characterization in general is usually non-destructive, they are fast and of simple implementation, uh, most recurring very simple preparation. So the sample preparation technique is not a very complicated one. Okay? And um, when we actually ap apply optical characterization techniques, uh, they employ the change in uh, or they study the change in the intensity of the incident radiation, the energy, the phase the direction or even the polarization okay, of the light wave after interaction with an object. So basically if you have a sample here, it might be a solid sample, it might be a liquid sample, there is some kind of radiation falling on it and then we can actually study the output radiation. Now this and this uh, might not be the same, there will be, might be a change in intensity, might be a change in energy, might be a change in phase, direction or polarization and that is what is studied to understand what are the optical properties of that particular material. But then this uh, change or this uh, output result that we have in different energy or intensity actually depends on the structural, the morphological, um, the electronic uh, and the physical properties so of the material. So that means if we can actually study that uh, transmitted uh, light uh, or the reflected light or the refracted light okay, or the scattered light in general. Uh, we can actually talk about the structure, morphology, electronic and physical property of the material. Now there has been very important discoveries which has been made based on this optical study. One of the most initial studies was actually nothing but the black body radiation which laid the foundation of uh, quantum mechanics by Max Planck. 
Now, this was also an optical property study. The discovery and the study of photoelectric effect which provided evidences of the dual nature of light. So, this is also uh, related to this field. Then the study of the optical emission from atoms and molecules uh, which provides evidence of their quantized uh, electron levels uh, that is also possible. Now, if you want to know what is the element that is there in the sun, you cannot really go and do a physical measurement. So, what is done is there is some kind of optical characterization that has uh, that is conducted and then uh, we can actually look into the spectrum of that and that spectrum will actually tell that the chemical element helium was present in the sun. So, this was actually discovered from the emission spectrum of the sun. So, this is also a part of the optical studies. So, optics and photonics are the branch. Uh, it is a totally different branch in physics, you can definitely do more specialization in this. But uh, as a matter of fact, in general, uh, these uh, application lies in uh, devices like a CD, DVD or a Blu-ray players okay? uh, um, or uh, even if you consider a barcode scanner which basically uses a laser, uh, low and uh, low power laser okay? that is also a use of optics. Digital cameras definitely depends on optics liquid crystal displays or the LEDs that you see is all optics. Fiber optics communication mostly used for internet technology and all it is again optics and then lasers, household and street lighting. If you consider something like car lights, paints, dyes, inks, lasers or even your printers, the laser printers these are all a part of optics and photonics. So, we can see that there is a lot of application there and if you just look into the very basic formula we know that E is equal to H nu. And then uh, if you basically write down the new in terms of wavelength, so it is hc divided by lambda. So, basically everything uh, originates from here which actually determines what is the energy of an incoming electromagnetic wave. If you know the wavelength, you can definitely know what is the energy. So, these are some of the uh, basics of uh, this optics. And light as waves uh, when it is incident on any kind of material, it will do a number of uh, tasks such as uh, diffraction, it may refract, it might interfere. Its propagation through space and energy transport can be described in terms of uh, wave motion. So, when we have the electromagnetic waves incident on a sample, we can say that uh, these are basically nothing but uh, electromagnetic waves. So, we have to study the wave nature of the material. And uh, if we actually study the wave nature of the material, that is definitely related with something which we call as lambda. If we know the lambda, we can know the wavelength. So, it is all uh, exploring the wave property of uh, the radiation that is incident. And uh, from there, we can actually find out what is the refractive index. So, in general, the definition of refractive index stands in as in the speed of light uh, in vacuum divided by the speed of light in medium. So, if we can actually uh, detect what is the change in the speed of light, we can also find out uh, what is the refractive index of that particular uh, medium or the sample that you are studying. So, when light uh, interacts with matter and then there is something which is called the light matter interaction, uh, we, we have a number of phenomena which can actually uh, come into picture. Uh, uh, the we have uh, something which we call as the molecular torsion, these lang la words are very much uh, uh, self explanatory and then uh, uh, it can also result in rotating the molecule. So, that is molecular rotation. Uh, they can actually be in the same orientation, but at the same time they might result in some kind of vibration which is the molecular vibration. But then there is also a possibility that there will be an electronic excitation. If the energy is uh, uh, equivalent or uh, relevant uh, to the system or it is it's having enough energy to knock out an electron, there might be an electronic excitation and then this might actually result to something which we call as the photo ionization. Photo ionization means we are actually having an electron knocked out because of the incoming radiation and then there is also a possibility that the electrons which are closer to the nucleus might be actually uh, given out uh, or given out or extracted because of the incoming radiation and this results in something which we call as the core electron emission. So, it entirely depends on how much energy is getting um, uh, incident on to the uh, sample. So, if you consider in the frequency range and if we go from the far infrared region to the X-ray uh, region, we have got the frequency on the higher end, frequency will keep on increasing and the wavelength will actually keep on uh, reducing. 
So, uh, if you consider the wavelength is reducing, that means the energy will keep on increasing. So, the lesser the wavelength, because we know E is inversely proportional to the wavelength, as we know. So, if the wavelength uh, reduces, okay, if the wavelength basically reduces, the energy will definitely increase. So, that means if you consider something like an X-ray, when it hits the sample, there is much more energy actually. Uh, and if you look into the uh, uh, scale of uh, optical uh, property studies, we can look into something which we call as, uh, let us say, the UV radiation. The UV radiation, the energy is around, let us say, 10 electron volt. Uh, it might be enough to actually knock out an electron and result in different process. So, if we like, want to look into the uh, more macroscopic point of view from an external point of view, basically light impingence or matter and when it impinges on matter, it can scatter and this scattering might be elastic or inelastic in nature. It might be absorbed by this material or it actually can be also be transmitted by the material. Now, this interaction as I have said in the previous slide will depend on what is the physical, chemical and the structural property of the matter as well as it will also depend on what is the nature of the incoming radiation, the intensity and the energy of the photon and so on. So, depending on this energy of the photon, different excitations are generated in the matter. So, you might have only an excitation of the electrons or you might have just a for passing of the radiation through it and so on. So, so, so it can generate a, something which we call as the exciton, something which we call, call as phonons and all. So, these things I am going to tell you in greater detail in, in the later lectures. Okay? But photons on the UV and the visible region of the spectrum, uh, let us say, for example, are more likely to interact with the electrons. So, if there is photons, that means the uh, packet of energy coming out from a UV radiation, uh, we basically have, uh, let us say, from the visible light or the UV radiation, uh, these photons will actually come and hit the sample and this will interact with the electrons of the outer shell. Uh, so, these electrons of the outer shell uh, will actually may get more energy and uh, this will actually result in creation of excitons. For now, let me just tell you excitons are nothing but a pair of electron and uh, hole pair which moves in tandem. So, it becomes very difficult to detect exciton because, uh, uh, because you cannot detect it directly because as a whole the exciton is neutral, but it is actually an electron hole pair which actually moves around the system in the conduction band. So, this actually is a result of photons which is actually from the UV or the visible light. On the other hand, if you consider something with the infrared photons, the photons which are actually coming from the infrared radiation, they will actually interact with the lattice and the molecular vibration and rotation creating phonons. So, you know phonons are nothing but a quantized state of lattice vibration. So, so you have to just refer to your solid state physics a bit more so that you are very clear about the mathematical part of this concept. But if you can generally, if we consider something like phonon and if we have infrared photons coming in, the infrared photons will actually have uh, lesser energy compared to that of photons uh, from the UV or the visible region. So, they really cannot uh, excite the electrons much, but definitely they will actually introduce some kind of vibration into the lattice system and actually this will result in something which we call as the phonons. So, if we just look into the type of excitation, so you have come, got an incoming radiation. Here we have not mentioned what kind of incoming radiation we are talking about really, but we can actually make it out from the characterization techniques that we are using. So, as I said, if I consider uh, phonon, we actually have uh, something which is the IR radiation which is incident. And then what happens is this phonon will actually result in the collective lattice vibration and the characteristics will actually more or less be neutral. So, you can actually study this okay, using the techniques like Raman, IR or photoluminescence. So, this will actually give you the information about the phonon vibration. On the other hand, if you have got something like an exciton okay, and the electron uh, and hole pair, it actually describes the bound state of the electron hole pair due to their mutual uh, Coulomb attraction. Usually, this is very difficult to detect as I said. Uh, they actually you obey the Bose-Einstein statistics. Okay? So, these are actually nothing but uh, integer spin uh, particles okay? and can bind with impurities and defects and other excitons. So, it is possible that they can also bind with other electrons. The study that can be conducted using this feature is nothing but photoluminescence or modulation reflectance and of course, the transmission studies. Next, we have got uh, the plasmon. So, this plasmon actually comes from the term plasma. So, if you consider plasma just as uh, 
uh, electromagnetic uh, waves or radiation has got photons the plasma has got something which we call as the plasmons okay so it is basically nothing but a uh, uh, counterpart of photons so we have got the collective motion of a charge carrier gas with respect to an oppositely charged rigid background i'll explain this in the more in the uh, next few slides and this is also neutral and then here by studying the plasmon actually results were in some studies which is the UV visible study or the IR study even the Raman study can be done. The Raman study on the other hand can be surface enhanced or tip enhanced. More technical terms we will come into that later. Then we have got uh, something which we call as the polaron. What a polaron? It describes the coupling of the electron or the holes and the longitudinal phonons. So it is basically a coupling between the uh, lattice vibration and of course the electrons and the holes. So the there is a kind of interaction between them and that interaction results in something which we call as the polaron. So it can actually bind with other polarons of the same or the opposite charge carrier and we can actually do absorption study from this. And finally we have got something which is called as the polariton and it actually describes the coupling between the exciton and the phonons. So we have got the exciton here and we have got the phonons here. If you want to know the connection between them, we have to actually have to study something which we call as the polariton. And here also we can actually do the Raman studies using this signal, Raman studies of the surface enhanced and as well as tip enhanced. So let me just give you a brief of the different kinds of uh, phenomenon that happens because of the electromagnetic interaction with matter. The first is phonon uh, which you I think already know from your knowledge of solid state physics that it is a unit of vibrational energy that arises from oscillating atoms within a crystal. So you have an atom within a crystal which basically oscillates because of some external energy which falls on it and this vibration is quantized and it is in the form of phonons. So a phonon is a discrete quant unit or quantum of vibrational mechanical energy. So quantum mechanics tells me that these phonons also exist in terms of packets and they are not continuous in nature. Next we have got something which we have called as uh, exciton. So as I said exciton is a combination of electron and a positive hole and an M positive hole can be considered as an empty electron state in a valence band. Now this is uh, free to move through a non-metallic crystal as a unit. So it can actually move around the system in the conduction band even uh, as a unit. So electrons and photons will usually move together in that system. And then we have got the plasmons. So as I said just as light uh, we have got the optical oscillation and these will actually consist of photon which will actually give out photons in general. Uh, the plasma oscillation if it oscillates it will actually consist of plasmons. So plasma is actually nothing but considered as the fourth state of matter okay we already know that. And then we have got something which we call as the polaron. So what are polarons? So these are nothing but the interaction between the electrons and the ions in the metal. So you have got the electrons in the system and then there might be some ions within the metal because we have an atom an electron has been knocked out. So that will actually become an ion but that ion and the electron will still have some kind of interaction. Okay? So it might be a different electron or the same electron that interaction is actually defined by something which we call as polaron. So this will actually result in a bound state the electron actually is attracted towards the ion it really cannot leave that system if we do not apply more energy. So this interaction is uh, uh, resulted in and we call it in terms of polaron and it is because of the lowering of the energy compared to the non-interacting system. So then uh, what happens is if you are actually considering any two kinds of material even if the nuclear energy we are considering or we are considering the atoms around the nuclear there is always some kind of interacting particle or interaction which is happening there is some kind of exchange of energy. So these plasmon polaron and all actually is a medium to exchange these kind of energies that we are talking about. Next we have got something which is polaritons. So polaritons are again nothing but quasi particles which are actually resulting from a strong coupling of the electromagnetic wave. So we have got an incoming radiation. So these are nothing but the strong coupling of the electromagnetic wave with an electric or magnetic dipole carrying excitation. Okay. So that 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 is uh, also there. Okay, we have studied. So that's all for today. In the next part, we are going to continue with more basics on optical characterization. Thank you.